Hey there, everyone. So we're going to be talking today about a few of the rules of evidence. If you're a returning member who just wants to get a little bit more in-depth knowledge, or whether you're a new member to FSU Mock Trial who's just trying to get their foothold in the rules of evidence, hopefully this will help you out. I'm Alex Kukulici, uh, I, the president in 2014. If you're listening to this down the line, I'll probably have been long forgotten. Speaking of someone who has been long forgotten, I would be remiss to not mention... You, you, this is where you, you follow up and introduce yourself, Cody. Oh, I thought you were you said... Oh, well, his, this is Matthew Card. He was the you. president before me. He's a shitter. He won a national championship or something, but... People don't like to rest on their laurels. This is him. He'll be helping me. Along with Daniel Krepsch, uh, in 2014, he rounded out our council table on defense, a good friend of mine, a uh, member of FSU Mock Trial for two years, one of our evidence gurus. So with that, we'll jump right in uh, as the title of the video uh, assumes, tells you, whatever is that we'll be talking about relevance. If you don't know what that means yet, don't worry. Um, just generally, the rules of evidence are there as guidelines for what is admissible or inadmissible in trial. Uh, relevance is one of the main tenets, one of the foundational principles of what is admissible and inadmissible. Uh, I'm going to pull up the document, the Midlands Rules of Evidence, right now, so that uh, when we read the rule, you can read along with us. Uh, before we, before we jump into relevance, I just want to sure. say something uh, generally about what we're going to do since this is the first evidence one. video. Yes. Um, none of what we're about to do as far as the next four or five videos is sufficient or will be sufficient for one's understanding of the rules of evidence. This is meant to be an introduction to sort of the core, really important four or five rules that are going to come up most often as you do mock trial and just sort of a, an introductory um, introduction into uh, those rules. Down the line, as time goes on, we're going to get more in depth. So, hopefully, by spring semester and by um, at least by the end of the year, everyone is is sort of at the the top of their evidence game. Because while evidence isn't scored in mock trial, it's really important because it's a way to control the courtroom, uh, command the judge's attention, and sort of control the pace and flow of the trial, and and keep the other team off balance and making their performance look bad. Um, so it's really important. It's sort of the gateway for uh, everything we do in mock trial. So while it's challenging and while it's difficult to learn, it's incredibly important to do so um, because it allows you to do everything in mock trial. Just for uh, people's reference, uh, videos that are only going to explain the most bare-bones rules and the bare necessities, essentially, for the rules of evidence will be listed under the tag basics. So this video is rules of evidence basics, rule 401. Uh, when we start going in more in depth on certain rules or whether there are certain rules that require uh, to more talking about them and going deeper into their theory, those will have the tag PhD. But uh, for now, these first five videos covering relevance, speculation, hearsay, opinion, testimony, and character evidence, those will all be basics. And uh, if you're a new member, that's what you should focus on because those five objections uh, kind of give you a very good base of 80%, 90% of the types of arguments you'll see in regards to the mm -hmm. rules of evidence uh, to hopefully make the entire document a little bit more palatable and understandable. With that, we'll jump right into rule, uh, to rule 401 here. I uh, have it pulled up on our screen, and uh, yeah, so Rule 401 uh, outlines what the test for relevance is. Rule 402 says that irrelevant evidence is inadmissible. So just with that notion in mind, evidence is relevant if A, it has a tendency to make a fact more or less probable than it would be without that evidence, and B, the fact is of consequence in determining the action. That's a bit of abstract language. Essentially, it means the fact is relevant if it tends to prove or disprove the eventual charges. Using this 2014 case of Park v. Duran, an example of relevant evidence would be whether Jesse Duran was holding a gun 
at some point on August 18th. Uh, if you have evidence that tends to prove that Jesse was holding a gun through whatever method, maybe someone saw him holding a gun, maybe someone shot a video of him holding a gun, that would be relevant evidence because obviously holding a gun is a material fact in the case of Park v. Duran. Uh, and Rule 402, like I said, just says that irrelevant evidence is inadmissible. So, yeah, so going next, is, in terms of determining the types of things that can be relevant, there's three, uh, I like to think of it as three basic uh, pillars of potentially relevant evidence. The first is if it directly goes to an element of a crime. The second is if it, there are a, there's a material fact at issue that the evidence tends to prove or disprove. And the third is whether the evidence goes to the bias and credibility of a witness. If any of those three things are happening, then the, then, then the thing is relevant. The piece of evidence is relevant. What You sort of outlined three different things that relevant evidence can go towards, and that's a fairly large umbrella. You're either talking about direct evidence that goes towards the actual charge in a criminal case or claim in a civil case, then you have any and all evidence that goes towards material facts that tend to prove or disprove those claims. And then you have any evidence that goes towards the bias or credibility of witnesses that are testifying about those material facts and those direct claims. That's a really large umbrella. And the takeaway point from that is, is that the threshold for what's relevant is actually incredibly low in real life. You really don't see a lot of relevance objections in actual trials. I've, I've been lucky enough to watch a lot of trials. Uh, a few months ago I served on a jury uh, for, for a civil case and I've yet to see a relevance objection in real life. Now they're very common in mock trial because teams like to include a lot of evidence that's entertaining but perhaps extraneous to what's at hand. But teams also really like to object to relevance to show off their evidence knowledge. We try here at FSU to not object to relevance too much unless we really feel we have a very strong leg to stand on. And the reason for that is once you object to relevance and you claim that something is not important to the facts at hand, it gives an opening for the other team and their response to an objection to really just shove it down your throat and to basically go into a mini closing argument of saying, this piece of evidence is relevant or important because it tends to prove this, which tends to prove this, which means so and so. And you're sort of giving the other side a chance to show what they know, and you really often don't have a leg to stand on. Nonetheless, you're going to make relevance objections because teams will do crazy stuff, but generally speaking, try not to make them unless you feel like something is truly, truly not important, and very rarely is that going to happen. And not only, remember the purpose of mock trial is to score points, and if the relevance objection you're making might keep out some minutia and entertaining fact as part of a character's backstory, just because something has that legal uh, correctness to it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be seen in a positive light for making that objection. So relevance objections should be used incredibly sparingly. In fact, I would go as far as to say, unless you are making a relevance objection that can cite a case law that has said a certain type of evidence is irrelevant, then I would, on the whole, never make a relevance objection. I actually don't think in my four years I have ever made a relevance objection, and I think that's how it should be for most. So when you're listening to this podcast, know that relevance is a basis for a lot of rules, especially in the 400s. Uh, the fact, the, the, just the very notion that a piece of evidence must be relevant before anything else needs to be taken into account is an important one and is an assumption that underlies the whole rules of evidence. But making objections under Rule 402 that this evidence is irrelevant it comes up very sparingly. So you'll be this is going to be more theoretical than anything and especially good for responding to objections to relevance because like, Matt, like Matthew said, when someone makes a relevance objection, it gives you the opportunity because you have a good and thorough understanding of your case to make a well well-anticipated and eloquent argument in response as to why this piece of evidence is relevant. And oftentimes that'll look very good for you. And those are missed opportunities if they aren't seized. 
Yeah, and I think the the one place you're going to find a resource to make relevance objections, it's, it's actually two places. One's going to be the order on motions in limine from you know whoever the judge is for the case who may say in, in a certain ruling, hey, evidence of this type is not relevant for, for so-and-so reason. For this trial, yet a team might not know the, mo- the order on motion. They might right. just... Or sometimes, there, like you said, there are cases that provided in the case law that, that say evidence of a certain type is not relevant under certain circumstances. Those would be the times I would make relevance objections because you can cite to an authority, right? The judge's ruling or case law. When you're just saying something's irrelevant and you're going off on a tangent about why it's relevant, it tends not to work out very well because lawyers generally know what's relevant and what's not, and their perception of relevance is that, again, it's a very low bar uh, to hurdle over, and most of the time you're going to lose and you're just wasting time. If you had to put a percentage on the bar that something needs to be relevant, uh, what would what would you say? There is no fixed number in any rules or authorities, but when we say it's a low bar, how low are we talking? Are we talking 50%? Are we talking 30%? How difficult is it in terms of its its potential usefulness in a trial? How, uh, how I, unuseful does I it I don't be? know if I can explain it in terms of a percentage, but like think of it this way. Like, if you were running and you had to jump over something and like that hurdle we'll call relevance, I think that hurdle is probably like three inches off the ground. If the evidence can jump over a three inch hurdle, I it's pretty much relevant. That's sort of the example I would use. Sure, uh, I would agree. And that might even be giving it a little bit. Yeah, too much <laughs> it may be lower than it may be lower than that. The 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 problem is there's no downside to letting in potential irrelevant evidence in most cases, barring it violates some other rule, uh, and this is how judges will look at it. But if there is potentially relevant evidence that would otherwise be admissible, that they're keeping out on relevance grounds, and that's very bad. So judges will almost certainly just allow you to talk at nauseum to potentially irrelevant facts. That's why it's a bad objection, difficult objection to win. Uh, okay. Um, I, I guess the only thing to do from there and with that explanation is to just explain the three types of things that can be relevant. Sure. sure. What, what are those? So the, fir- the first is a material fact. So what is a material fact and how is it relevant uh, for the purposes of Rule 402? Yeah, so a material fact is any fact in the case or any item in dispute, not necessarily that it's factual, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a place of contention between the two sides. Uh, a material fact is something that is important or, again, using the word in the definition, relevant to determining the result of the action. So for the example you gave in this case, let's say your, your, um, your charge is uh, intentional shooting, right? That's the claim you're going for. An example of a material fact that Kook gave you was, was Jesse holding the gun? The fact that Jesse was or was not holding the gun is a material fact uh, that would tend to prove or disprove whether or not Jesse uh, intentionally shot Sidney. Now, you can actually take it one step further. Here's another example of a material fact that's one step removed from that. Are Jesse's fingerprints on the gun? Now, whether or not Jesse's or fingerprints are on the gun, the, the presence or absence of those fingerprints tends to prove or disprove whether or not Jesse was in fact holding the gun, which tends to prove or disprove whether or not he's uh, guilt not guilty, excuse me, uh, you know, responsible, or his parents are responsible for the intentional shooting. And you can, you you can, can continue take that all the way down the line. Right? It, it, it goes the next step farther would be, well, maybe you don't have evidence or in a specific instance that his hands were on the gun in any way, fingerprints or a video, but that the kid knew about the gun. That could be an example of a relevant piece of information because he had to, it's, required that he know about the gun that he then used to commit this shooting. And down the line you go, that means he needs to know what a gun is. And right. all of all of this, it can be significantly removed. So you, you, I, to actually take the fingerprint example down the line even further, here, here's another piece of relevant information. What is the science behind fingerprint identification? So I forget what the, the witness, I think it's uh, Sebastian, Jules Sebastian, that'll Correct. testify to fingerprint science. I think he says 
the standard in the field is 16 or 17 points of identification. So that's relevant for determining whether or not those are actually Jesse's fingerprints and down up the, down up the line you go. The next step that could be important is what is Jewel Sebastian's relationship to the case? Is he biased? Is he being paid? Does he have any connection to the victims or, or whatever? That's relevant for determining his credibility about his testimony about fingerprint science, which goes back up the line again. So that's why I say it's a big umbrella. It's a very low bar because really anything that can be connected in a, in a linear fashion like that back to the ultimate issue of liability is relevant. And you can basically give me any fact in this case and I could make a somewhat compelling argument that it's relevant. Um, so, and, that, and that's why we recommend really not objecting unless you have some sort of authority to cite to. Now, the next uh, group of things, pieces of evidence, types of evidence that can be relevant are uh, evidence that goes directly to prove or disprove uh, an element of a crime. This doesn't come up very often. Usually material facts are used to prove uh, things circumstantially and sometimes directly. But there are some cases where an element of a crime, and we'll explain the elements of, uh, of a charge later and in depth. You'll hopefully have that knowledge before you come seeing this video. But uh, what's an example of an element that could be directly proved by a fact. Perhaps maybe a mental state if a crime requires a requisite mental state. Uh, I would say, yeah, the two that it. yeah, the two that pop in my head are intent and knowledge. Right. Those, so the, this for something to be com and in this case it's willful misconduct. That's the the type of intent required for to have a guilty verdict in intentional shooting. Well to determine whether someone was acting willfully, that can just any evidence that goes to prove or disprove that Jesse acted willfully in committing the shooting is relevant. And it's pretty basic. If you ask Jesse, did you willfully do this, and he says yes or no, that is relevant. And obviously, just like the fingerprint example, that can be extrapolated out. That's the most uh, clear example uh, of that, though. The most direct way to attack it. Uh, and the most obviously relevant. Yeah, it's sort of just a, it's just a, it's just a, a sort of a chart or, or, or a logic chain. First step is, does a piece of evidence tend to prove a direct element of the claim? So knowledge, intent, uh, you know, whatever, whatever that is. If it doesn't directly prove that, does it tend to prove or disprove a fact that tends to support one of those charges? And that's what 99.9% .9 of your... Uh, of relevance. Your relevance issues are going to be because very rarely does something just straight up prove an element of a claim. If, if if it was that easy, you wouldn't need a trial, right? So most of the time, you're going to be dealing with material facts, and it's your job when responding to a relevance objection. And I promise, when you're playing scrubby teams, you will get them because they don't know, like us, not to object to relevance. It's your job to connect whatever piece of testimony you're trying to get out to ultimately that. Uh, you know, whatchamacallit, the, the ultimate element you're trying to prove. Correct. Uh, the last uh, group, I'll, I guess I'll throw this up to Krebs, who's been quiet for most of this. We've just really been reading the rule, uh, mostly. Uh, the third group is bias and credibility. So what does, what does bias and credibility mean? Because it, it, it's pretty different than the type of relevance of material facts or elements of a crime. Uh, when you're talking about bias and credibility, you are talking about uh, the witness who's testifying and whether what other what, whatever piece of information that you are trying to elicit about a certain witness or or character um, goes to affect their ability or competency to uh, to say something. So uh, credibility is whether certain witness is reliable. Um, when they're talking about a certain fact, so uh, we'll we'll get into uh, personal knowledge and and lay opinions later, but uh, lay witnesses, just some random person off the street, can't talk about uh, things that require uh, technical knowledge uh, because they're not whatever they would have to say about that. It's not credible. We it it's hard to believe them. Um, so we leave that to other witnesses. Uh, for bias, uh, bias also goes to reliability, but 
uh, more in the sense that if they are biased against either someone like the defense or defendant or even someone on the plaintiff or prosecution side, if they're biased against a certain individual, then our ability to believe what they have to say about that individual is compromised to some extent. So what are some types of evidence that are going to be commonly found within affidavits or expert reports that go towards bias or credibility? Uh, so f the one that jumps to my mind is, uh, in this case, is Danny Brooks, the babysitter, who mentions in his affidavit that uh, the parent of Jesse Duran didn't pay him, the babysitter, to look after uh, that parent's uh, son or daughter, Jesse. Uh, so it could go towards the bias of the babysitter if he were testifying against uh, Hayden Duran, the parent, um, that Hayden didn't pay him or the babysitter money and the babysitter thought he should be paid money. What about experts? Uh, so for experts, if they are being called, say, for the, uh, if the defense is calling them, then you can make an issue of whether their uh, opinions and conclusions are biased against the other party. If they're being paid a certain amount of money, uh, as experts normally are, uh, then that can also be used to show a bias against the other party. Yeah, I think I think that's a fairly comprehensive overview of of bias and credibility. Just generally speaking, any evidence, no matter how infinitesimally small, that affects the motivation to testify for a witness or the credibility or a phrase that I like to throw around with judges that they really enjoy, veracity for truthfulness or one's uh, likelihood and propensity to tell the truth, any evidence that goes towards that is relevant because witnesses are testifying and anything that affects their credibility is ultimately relevant to the, to the cause of action. This is probably the most common type of relevance to argue about. People just seem to either not know or not understand just how low the bar is in regards to this type of relevance issue. So people will object to you eliciting testimony about uh, witnesses' pay grade, how if they're an expert that was paid a certain amount, and... Uh, this, so this is pretty important, and oftentimes just saying this testimony goes to show a bias or a lack of credibility on the part of the witness will allow you to move on uh, from this type of issue. Unlike ish relevance objections about material facts or elements, you can't really go into a whole closing spiel if the reason you're trying to elicit this evidence is bias. So uh, it, the response is to arguments about bias are slightly different in that way to responses about material facts and elements. Just know right. that. You can't, you can't just say, well, this is relevant because this witness's testimony goes to prove an element of, of the case, and, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't quite work that way. You just mention that this goes to the bias and credibility of the witness, and judges will understand. That's one of the defining tenets of the rules of evidence. And, yeah. ta and tack on at the end that bias and credibility are always at issue. That's the it, phrase, that yeah, that's the phrase you want to use. Bias and credibility are always at issue. Yeah, and I, I, think I, I think I once got a relevance objection. It was probably at regionals because it's those teams that are most commonly going to object to relevance to things like bias and credibility. I'm pretty sure my response was, Your Honor, it goes to credibility and overruled and it may, it, it, the brevity of the response sort of shoves it back in their face. It's very dismissive and yeah. uh, almost powerful to respond in that way. So just don't overthink it when it's about bias and credibility. As a general rule, know why you're asking a specific question and relevance issues should never be, relevance objections should never be an issue for you. Uh, one last thing on relevance before we move on to the next rule. Uh, relevance when you're responding to it, you want to make sure that uh, you have a good response to it, that it sounds nice, that you've picked your words carefully. So the basic way to respond to relevance objections verbally in terms of the structure of the sentences, this testimony is relevant because blank. It proves a material fact or go, tends to prove or disprove a material fact. It goes directly to 
insert element of the crime, but the phrasing you want to use, just try and get really comfortable and consistent with it. You don't want to be stumbling for it. Because relevance, you have the opportunity to soapbox. People will tend to overthink their arguments, and they will come off unconfident in the delivery. Just try to keep it as basic and formulaic as possible, because if you sound calm and collected when delivering it, it'll seem as though you've thought in advance as to why the specific testimony is relevant. And just that, just having the illusion that you've thought specifically about the relevance of this individual specific fact is usually enough to get past these types of objections. So the type of phraseology is, like Krepp said at the beginning, try to end on bias and credibility is always at issue when it's that type of relevance objection. And when you just have a normal relevance objection about a material fact at issue, just say, this testimony is relevant because it tends to disprove or prove this material fact, whatever the material fact you're trying to disprove or prove is. And you should be fine 99 out of 100 times. What I've, what I've found with responding to relevance objections, and this is, a, this is a general rule, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, the more words that come out of your mouth when responding to a relevance objection, the less relevant the evidence sounds. And that's why the bias and credibility response is so effective, because it's literally just saying, Your Honor, it goes to bias and credibility. Done, right? It's obvious what it means. The more you have to say, the more words you throw in to make it sound relevant, in the judge's mind, it just sounds like you're blabbering. It doesn't actually sound relevant. So one of the things I try to do um, through the years of doing mock trial was to get my relevance objections as tight and succinct as possible. This evidence is relevant because it tends to prove this fact. That's it. Right. So if I was getting that objection about the fingerprints, Your Honor, uh, evidence about how many points of, uh, of identification are required for identifying a, a fingerprint is relevant to show that uh, it was, in fact, Jesse Durant's fingerprint on the loaded gun. Right. That can be a response. You would never get that objection because fingerprint science is obviously relevant. Um, but that, that sort of thing of just repeating what the testimony is connect it to a material fact, and that's your response. And most of the time, you're going to win. 99 of 100 times, you're going to win. So, uh, thanks for watching. If you have any questions or I have one, Wait, wait, one more. I want to work, okay. through, a, I want to work through an example. That's sure. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is good. Okay. So, I'll be... I'll ask the, the... I'll sort of lead the discussion. You guys can sort of answer my hypothetical questions, perhaps. Sure. So, all right. So, let's work through a... It's sort of a classic textbook example of a of a car accident, right? So uh, there was a car accident between someone and, and someone else. The car was going, um, uh, let's say in order to prove reckless driving, uh, you know, some elevated, uh, oh, I just drew all over your face. Oops. Good. So that's where it went. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Anyway. Um, Let's say if I, I'm bringing a civil action against someone for a car accident, and I have to prove that they were going at least 80 miles an hour because the speed limit is you know, 60 miles an hour. In order to prove my claim, they have to be driving at least 20 miles over the speed limit. And somehow that going 80 miles per hour was the direct cause of the accident. Let's assume all that's there. Okay. So I have this piece of evidence, and this piece of evidence is that 30 miles south of the accident, so let's say you got a highway you know, going north to south, 30 miles south of the accident, the driver, the person I'm suing, was going 80 miles an hour. Let's say that's all the information you have. Is that, in your mind, relevant? So not at the, the site of the accident, but 30 miles south of that on the trip he was going 80 miles an hour. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, would, I would make an argument... Well, I don't know if I would, but I could make an argument um, that it is relevant. Uh, one, to show that the vehicle was capable of moving at 80 miles per hour, which goes to show that 30 miles north of there, it could have also been going at 80 miles per hour. Second, that the driver himself was capable of making the car go 80 miles per hour, so it makes it more likely that 30 miles north, or excuse me, yeah, 30 miles north of that uh, place, the driver could have still been going 80 miles per hour. Anything is that, that what you were looking for? 
No, th- my, my, I guess my point is there are so many different things that it can be offered for. I'm trying to demonstrate how low that bar is because when you think about it logically, whether or not he was driving 80 miles an hour, 30 miles south of the accident site doesn't matter. Prove. because no, Right, it doesn't prove anything because the all that matters is was he going at least 80 at the side of the accident and did that speed cause the the whatever, right, the accident. Here's an example. What if we have an a sort of inner... What's the word? I can't pronounce today. Um, intermediary. Is that a word? I'm yes, confused yes. today. An intermediary fact. Um, in between the ultimate point of was he going 80 at the site and 80 miles of, or thir- 80 miles an hour, 30 miles south of that, what if we have evidence on the odometer of the car or you know some computer in the car that he maintained his speed for 30 miles? That from that point to the point of the accident on the car's computer system, 80 miles an hour was maintained for a total distance traveled of 30 miles. That, that's sort of an intermediary fact that could exist in your facts that can connect this fact that's way out here to your ultimate goal of proving something that's way out here. So there are facts that lie in the middle there that can bridge those two together and bridge those two together and that's how you get that's how you get through relevance arguments by connecting this fact that's out here to a fact that's much closer to what you're trying to prove. Uh, another example can be, and this is sort of outlandish as expert testimony, but let's roll with it anyway. Let's say you get an expert up there who says, people who speed at point A, point A being 30 miles south, studies show that they also speed at point B, the side of the accident. That's scientific testimony that can connect the fact that's out here to the fact that's over here. And your case is going to give you a lot of intermediary facts that are going to lie in the middle there. And that's how you connect um, with relevance. There are uh, just one more subsection of relevance. Uh, Very rarely does it come up. But if you're trying to elicit one of those intermediary facts uh, in a situation where either end hasn't really been established, it could come off as irrelevant. So you're in a case about an accident that occurred on a highway, and there's testimony about a computer system in the car that says that the speed was maintained. That, without the knowledge that 30 miles south, the car was going 80 miles an hour, isn't relevant for proving the eventual thing that needs to be proven, that the car was going 80 miles an hour at the time of the accident, but its relevancy is conditioned on that fact. It, it must, it, eventually you will elicit the fact that at eight, that there was 80 mile an hour, 30 miles south, and that kind of completes the whole picture. And that's called relevancy conditioned on fact. It's only relevant if these other things are true. Uh, the example I use for, for this is uh, last year's case, a robbery at an amusement park, a knife was used. And the color of the knife that's used in a robbery is irrelevant on first glance, but it was relevant in that case because it was used to prove ownership. So unless you could establish Whit Bowman, the suspect, owned a blue knife, then the color of the knife wasn't relevant. There are other reasons it might be relevant, and you can come up with those on your own. Perhaps uh, it's useful in identifying it from other witnesses. Uh, Perhaps if it's blue as opposed to black, it was easier to see at night. Well, whatever reason. But specifically in regards to identification, you need the fact that Bowman owns a blue knife to see whether it was his knife that was being used during the course of the robbery. And that's what makes the fact that the knife was blue relevant. So I think that's, I think now we're finally through on evidence. Hopefully it wasn't too on tedious. To we're not through on evidence. Oh, uh, <laughs> this is it. That's all you need to know. You've got it, guys. <laughs> Good luck. Okay, so we'll be moving on to the next video. I'm assuming that will be character evidence, rule 404.